Uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry for the sorry for the delay. The uh, it's, it struck me that ev everything in cryobiology is related intimately with the properties of water and the structure of water, and it seemed to me that the topic of this symposium was that particularly appropriate any time in cryobiology, and maybe particularly for this 50th anniversary. Now, one of the essential things in cryobiology in, in, in general is that they must, if you're trying to cryopreserve cells, they must be frozen in such a way as to avoid the formation of intracellular ice. And there have been two ways that have evolved to do that. One, the older so-called classical way is to cool them slowly so that they lose all their freezable water uh, osmotically and end up with uh, little freezable water left and the residual may undergo vitrification. The alternative method has been uh, to cool them, to load them with high concentrations of um, glass forming solutes and cool rapidly and induce, and induce vitrification. The, uh, I'm, most of the speakers are gonna be talking about uh, about the cooling effects. My emphasis is gonna be on the warming aspects of it, but I do wanna make a couple of introductory statements about, uh, about the cooling aspects. And just to sort of, uh, see, just to sort of orient you, here's sort of a thermometer-like schematic of some of the important temperatures, and I'm not going to discuss most of them. Uh, this is the melting, thermodynamic melting temperature the solution or the cells generally super cool, and that, that, end, that has to end ordinarily at this so-called T sub H, which is the homogeneous nucleation temperature. That's the temperature at which the probability becomes very high that enough molecules will orient themselves into an ice-like structure, which is big enough to uh, be stable and then undergo growth. Now above that you can have heterogeneous nucleation where ice forms as a result of external nucleators, the best of which of course is ice itself. And then the next one of interest here is T sub G, the glass transformation temperature below which water, if there's any, if, if it hasn't frozen and it's super cooled, it gets converted into, uh, into a glass. And then here's liquid nitrogen at minus 196 or 77K. So when cells are cooled down to this region below T sub G, they exist in one of two states, really. They, either, they have, either the water in them is frozen, or the water is vitrified, or one can have a mixture of the two. And uh, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to mention the following facts. Now, the, this vitreous state is, thermo, is, is can be stable for centuries or even millennia, but it is thermodynamically unstable, and given proper time and temperature, it will convert into, into the stable form, which, it, which is, of course, is ice. So the... Um, One question is, how, how does one determine what the state of the water is at this point? That is to say, whether it's vitrified or whether it's crystallized. And I had thought at one time that one could distinguish them between uh, thermodynamically or calorimetrically, because if it had frozen, it would have released the latent heat of fusion. But uh, if it had vitrified, there would be basically no heat change. And so, uh, the, but in per further consideration, I think that logic is wrong. The latent heat diffusion of ice is 80 calories per gram at zero, but that decreases by half a calorie per degree as one cools, and that half a, ha that half a calorie is the difference between the specific heat of water and the specific heat of ice. So that by the time, say, if you were to cool it to the glass transformation temperature, the uh, L, sub P, L sub F would only be 15 calories per mole. This is, there's nothing magic about this, actually. I think it's a manifestation of 
first law of thermodynamics that, that basically says there are two, sta two energy states, initial A and a B, that the difference between those two states, the energy difference is independent of the path taken to uh, reach that. So that if you take a gram of water and you were to freeze it at zero and then cool it to minus 100, it'd be the same energy as taking that gram of water, cooling it as water to minus 100, and then freezing it. So the only one, presumably today, it would be very difficult calorimetrically to distinguish between these two. One possibility is X-ray diffraction, but this, one, one problem with X-ray diffraction is you cannot distinguish the state of the water inside cells from the state of the water in the outside medium. And I don't know, maybe people can answer this as to, to what extent X-ray diffraction can distinguish the percentage of a system that has been, is either vitreous or ice, and to what extent the crystal size affects the uh, diffraction pattern that one gets. Well, the, as I mentioned in the beginning, one, one way to cryopreserve cells is to, is, to cool, is to cool them slowly so they dehydrate. But in the past decade or so, there's been increased emphasis on uh, the alternative method of vitrification. One class of uh, cells where that tends to be required is, are those that are extremely chill sensitive. And one classic example of that is uh, Drosophila. Here's a plot of uh, survival of Drosophila as a function of the time that they're held at, in this case, it's different sub-zero temperatures. There's no freezing occurs in these three curves, but you can see that the rate of killing accelerates rapidly as one cools to lower and lower temperatures. So the question is, is, is the chilling injury rising or increasing so rapidly that if you try to cool them slowly to achieve this equilibrium of freezing, uh, you, will, uh, you will kill them by the, uh, by the chill injury itself. And from these curves, we could calculate activation energies. And from the activation energies, we could compute how much death there ought to be at different temperatures. And if you do that, you'll see that da the da dollar line or dash line represents that calculation. The solid line and the symbols show what the measured survival was. When these were when they cooled at uh, two tenths of a degree a minute. My mouth is dry. I think it's an adrenaline effect, I believe. The um, Anyway, so that the, there's a good match here between the theory and the experimental, which means you cannot succeed in cryopreserving Drosophila by slow freezing approaches. The alternative then is to outrace the chilling injury by cooling at high rates, but if you try to cool at high rates, you kill them by intracellular freezing, and the only way to avoid that is to uh, suspend them and is to go a vitrification route and and. Um, in the case of Drosophila, that was done by high concentrations of methylene glycol. And that strategy actually did work. We were able to get 80% survival. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this. this, is just the graph I meant to take out, but uh, showing that 80% survival right here. I should mention that Peter Stepankis and uh, Stanley Lebo was involved in that, Bill Raw. Uh, it's also succeeded following a very similar, very similar strategy. Now, another area that slow equilibrium freezing has problems with is that when you try to freeze complex tissues and organs, and uh, single cells are ordinarily not affected by, or relatively little affected by, extracellular ice. But that's not the case with tissues and organs where ex either intercellular ice, that is ice between the cells, can in fact cause damage. And a number of people in this audience, including Greg Fay and Brian Woke, for example, our speakers, have, are using vitrification in an attempt to avoid external ice formation. Well, 
Let me see where I am here. Regardless of how you freeze them, they, they have to be, a cell has to be warmed before it can determine if it survives and to measure its functionality. And, uh, and so uh, our interest began oh, some seven years ago with, with this whole area of interest in freezing and supercooling and this and that. And we, uh, we, we by we, I mean primarily Shinsky Seki and I, uh, made, some, uh, made some measurements of the temperature at which, in this case, mouse oocytes underwent intracellular freezing. And we essentially confirmed what uh, Stanley Lebo and Bill Rawl had demonstrated uh, a number of years before that, that these oocytes, if they're suspended in one and one and a half molar ethylene glycol or glycerol, actually supercool to low temperatures like minus 39 before they freeze. And here's some pictures I often use Bill Rawls' data showing eight cell embryos in this case cooled at 20 degrees a minute. Uh, and you can see, see, read the temperatures here. They be, this black flashing is a manifestation of intracellular freezing. And it begins here at about, what is that, minus 31, is that? And you, there's six, five of them here. And you can see that between there and here, they, all of them undergo this black, fl back free, black freezing, black bugs blood. And um, the, the interesting, th and we found the same thing. The interesting thing about that is it provides an alternative. Well, I need to make one other statement. Um, no, that's OK. Uh, that provides an opportunity to cool them in a different way, or that is to dehydrate them in a different way. Namely, well, let me illustrate it here. In equilibrium freezing, you ordinarily, here is a plot of the percentage of the cell water as a function of temperature. In an equilibrium slow freezing, they, you, you attempt to freeze slowly enough so they follow this equilibrium curve. An alternative way is to cool them rapidly to some temperature above the temperature at which they nucleate, that is above minus 35 or so, and then hold them iso isothermally and let them dehydrate along here. Please ignore this. It's a technical detail I just don't want to get into. So the qu question we pose to ourselves and then is what would happen now if you hold them various lengths of time and then cool them rapidly down to minus 70. And uh, what happens, I think, is very interesting. Experiment then was to, um, was to hold them at minus 25 for various lengths of time, and then observe, observe, observe them under a Lincoln Cryer stage. And here, for example, they were held five minutes, and you can see that 80% of them turned black, that is, underwent intracellular freezing during a 50 degree a minute cool after the hold. If you increase that time to 10 minutes, only 12% flash during cooling, but now 88% of them blackened during warming. In both cases, there was, after we thawed them, they were clearly dead, no survival. If you increase the holding time now to, uh, to, 20, 20, uh, to 30 minutes, or 20 minutes first here, now none of them flash during cooling, uh, the number that reduced during warming or flat blackened during warming is only 38. Now we began to get some survivors. If we held them for 25, uh, sorry, 30 minutes, then we got almost, almost none of them, well, none of them froze flash during cooling, very few of them blackened during warming, and, um, and now we were getting 80% normal. Well, what's, the, what's going on here? Our, our assumption or our hypothesis is that this blackening is a representation of recrystallization. And recrystallization is a consequence of the fact that, that the um, surface free energy of small ice crystals is greater than that of large ice crystals. And therefore, there's a tendency for small to be converted to, to large. It's a manifestation of the um, Kel I'm sorry, I had one other. I was just going to skip that one. It was a, a, a manifestation of, uh, of the Kelvin equation. Well, here's an actual photograph. We, what we decided we were going to do then was to measure the rates at which this blackening occurred during warming. 
And uh, so here we're, what we did was to a whole, uh, cool the cells rapidly down to minus 70, warm them rapidly to minus 62, and then hold them for, in this case, five minutes, 12 minutes, and 24 minutes. And you can see this progressive blackening. So they say the, these, these have been held 10 minutes. We'd cool them to minus 25, held them 10 minutes, cool them rapidly to minus 70, warm them to minus 62.5, and now held them for these lengths of time. And uh, the turning black, we hypothesized it's a manifestation of a recrystallization, and that comes about what I said, that the small crystals have a higher surface free energy than the large ones. And uh, here's, the, here's the, a simplified version of the Kelvin equation showing the difference in chemical potential or vapor pressure between uh, water but, uh, over a curved surface versus a uh, planar infinite radius of curvature. So we did that for a, a whole series of, we again being second, a whole series of temperatures and then end up with a table like this, which you can't read, but uh, it, it basically, well, for example, if you, if you hold them at minus 70, it takes them about half an hour to reach the first stages of blackening. If you warm them now to minus, uh, let's see, what is it, minus um, 40, minus 45, I think it is, then it takes them only one minute to, uh, to uh, begin to show blackening. So there's an enormous effect of temperature. So we did that for a whole series of temperatures. And from these data on this slide, or this slide, numbers, the data on the slide permit one to create an, or cr or, yeah, create an erroneous plot, which is shown here. And it's a surprisingly pretty curve, pretty straight line. An erroneous plot, as I guess all of you know, is a plot of the log logarithm of the rate against the reciprocal of the absolute temperature. And twice this slope is a measure, according to Arrhenius and Irene, of the, of the activation energy for the process. So the activation energy for this recrystallization is very high value, about 27 and a half kilocalories per mole. Interestingly, a number of years before this, Kingery had published a paper where he had taken two spheres of ice put them together and then measure the rate at which the neck filled in between the two spheres. And he came up with the almost identical figure for the act, well, it was the identical figure of 27 and a half kilocalories per mole. Uh, for, again, from this Arrhenius plot and the activation energy, one can calculate what the effective warming rate would be. And that's shown here. I'm not, it's a sort of complicated graph, and I'm not going to take the time to go in detail. But basically, what these solid curves represent are these calculations for how the, the, how the temperature at which different degrees of blackening uh, is a function of the rate of warming. The faster you warm, the higher the temperature at which the blackening occurs. And it, the calculations say that for every tenfold increase, in warming rate, there's a temperature at which they reach a certain blackened level uh, increases by a factor, by eight degrees. With the Lincoln Cryer stage, we could only test two of those, namely warming at 10 degrees and 100 degrees a minute, and that's what the symbols show. And actually, it's, I think, surprising that the agreement is as good as it is, that the theory and the uh, observed blackening is a function of warming warming rate or function of temperature at given warming rates agrees, agrees so well. So uh, this whole idea, so well, if the, if the warming rate is that critical to blackening and presumably recrystallization, then maybe survival is as well. And uh, so we did, we started a series of experiments where we looked at the effects, keep on. Uh, we uh, did a whole series of experiments where we um, looked at the effects of this matrix of effects of four different cooling rates and five different warming rates 
using uh, straws, that is the standard insemination straws, which look very much like an ordinary drinking straw. And uh, we, by insulating the straws in various ways, we were able to uh, create this, these different rates. These were all plunged into liquid nitrogen and then warmed, warmed by uh, putting into a water bath at 25. The, the striking thing here was that in this case where they were warmed slowly, 140 degrees a minute, survivals were essentially zero, irrespective of the cooling rate. At the other extreme, if they were warmed at the highest rate achievable, survivals were high, again, pretty much irrespective of the warming rate. And that's uh, shown graphically here. The upper curve is the, uh, the uh, survivals as a function of cooling rate for the highest warming rate. Survivals are high over the entire spectrum of cooling rates. And here, the opposite. If they're warm slowly, then survivals are either zero or very near zero, irrespective of the cooling rate. The, another, these days, common vehicle for vitrifying cells are cryotops. And here's a picture of a, of a cryotop. It's a small, has a small plastic blade. And uh, Secchi, with his uh, skilled hands, was able to cement using nail polish, a very fine thermocouple to that. And here's a little puddle of about two-tenths of a microliter of medium with the uh, cells embedded, embedded in it. So again, we subjected these uh, to a matrix of cooling and warming rates. In this case, they were much higher. The rates were much higher because of the small dimensions of the cryotop and the small volume being frozen. But the same general result Standard Lebo showed the same uh, figure yesterday. Here's a survival at the highest warming rate, again, pretty much independent of the cooling rate. And here is survival at the lowest warming rate, uh, not some mostly independent of cooling rate, although there is this interesting tendency that the faster you cool, the worse it is, or that they're more sensitive to a given warming rate. Uh, that it's just a, a suggestion that that's the case. So this raised the interesting question up. One of the problems with vitrification approaches is the concentrations are very high, so sort of in the limit of survivability of cells. And the question is, if you warm them at these very high rates, could you then use more dilute solutions? And oh, I mentioned this just to show these rates are, are not just dreams. Uh, these are oscillographic recordings that Fritz Klein has made of both the highest cooling rate, which is about 69,000 degrees a minute, and the highest warming rate. This is, these are the bare cryotops of about 120,000 degrees a minute. So we, we have estimates, these measurements of what the rates actually are. So anyway, it raised the question of whether you could possibly get, you possibly could reduce the con required concentration by cutting back on the, um, uh, by warming at, the, at, at very high rates. And uh, this was, had been suggested as a possibility some years ago by Greg in these, this plot here, which is the, the rate of, the ordinance, the rate of warming to prevent I get, I'm not sure it was devitrification or recrystallization. The abscissa is the weight percent concentration of different solids. At any rate, here's a, here again is the survival. EFs, as, as um, Bo Jin mentioned yesterday, EFs is our vitrification solution. And this is the full strength one, which is about 7 molal, 7.4. And here, here um, timer. And um, anyway, here's the survival with the highest warming rate here with two lower warming rates. We did experiments where we, now we cut the concentration in half, and now you see that the survival of the highest warming rate is still up around 90%, but the survival of the lower warming rates is now dropping away. 
Well, they said, okay, if we can warn them, if we can get survivals with half strength using 117,000 degrees a minute, could we get high survivals with lower concentrations if we increase the warming rate? And Fritz and I came up with the idea of using pulse la IR laser to achieve these higher warming rates. And uh, I, you've already heard a talk. You've, you've already heard a talk by Bujin showing some of the features of it. Tomorrow, you will hear from Fritz um, some of the details of the thing. I'm just going to flash quickly through the thing and stop here. I just want to acknowledge people involved in this. Uh, the primary experimental work that I showed you here was done with Shinsky Seki, who is here at the meeting, and then other aspects with Bo Jin and with Fritz and with Stanley Olibo. And I do want to, and, and, and Estefania Paridi spent four, four a month, great months with me, this, at least I thought they were great, uh, this uh, fall and winter working on what the paper she gave yesterday about the relative lack of effect of uh, external vitrification or freezing. And I do want to emphasize the support I've had in this throughout almost 10 years now from, from NIH. And I'm going to stop now trying to I, oh, the other speakers on the threat of death that they have to keep on time. So, <laughs> so I'll, uh, now I'll take just a couple of questions I do want to, I do want to Keep on, and I think it's more important that many of you heard my spiel many times. But some, our next, our next uh, three speakers really are people you haven't heard that much, and I want to make sure that they have a lot of time. So, are there any quick questions? Yeah. How much ice do you have? So that you can cool as, as low as hundred and then warm up at hundred thousand. But how much ice do you have in the beginning that you can overcome to the survival? How much ice in a quantitative mass amount, you mean? Well, let's say the, the droplet is one-tenth or two-tenth of a microliter. So you have that much, well, depending whether it vitrifies or not, of course. It's either ice or it might, it might even vitrify. Uh, well, that's the mass. Basically, and uh, and then uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm. Do you see any ice at the end of the cooling? Well, I can't can't tell really. We are we the uh, and that wouldn't be very meaning too meaningful anyway. But say from it, from what Estefania said yesterday, it doesn't it doesn't make it. Let me let me go back to one slide. I think it might answer something. I didn't mention it, but if you, if you notice these black filled in circles here and the open circle, in the cases of the black ones where the cooling rate was very low, then we got the, then the medium itself froze. In the case of here, where the open circles, the medium stayed transparent, presumably vitrified. So the point indication here and what she showed in her talk was it doesn't make doesn't seem to make any difference to, or little difference to survival whether the medium freezes or vitrifies, and in her case she also did work with the cryotops and the same conclusion there. So I guess I, that that's the best answer we have is that that that's just the external medium. We don't know what we can't see in this case what happens inside the cells. Okay, well let me let me uh, okay sure go ahead. Peter, how are you achieving the uh, 118,000 degree Celsius thermometer? How achieving it? Well, it's just it's what the cryotop is a very small object, has a very small thermal mass, and it's just a matter of that. You, you've uh, you, all all of these recent vitrification approaches, cryo loops and cryo tops and this and that, are really all dependent on the fact that you're cooling, a ver you're cooling a very low mass, small mass, and that allows you to get pretty high rates. I think my own personal feeling is that, that those numbers I gave, that's 60,000 degrees a minute cooling, 140,000 warming are probably the limit with this sort of thermal you might get higher. People, get, electron microscopists use things like liquid ethane, 
which might give you somewhat higher cooling rate. Thanks, so how are you getting the embryo of that form, that rate? You're going from minus 196 to a water bath? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, uh, yes, 25 degree water bath.